ideas come from? Where do they come from, do I think? Ideas come from the earth. They come from every human experience that you either witness or have heard about, translated into your brain in your own sense of dialogue, in your own language form. Uh, ideas are born uh, from what is smelled, heard, seen, experienced, felt, emotionalized. Ideas are probably uh, in the air, like, like little tiny items of ozone. That's the easiest thing on earth, is to come up with an idea. Then the second thing is, the hardest thing on earth is to put it down. Who was it uh, that said, writing is the easiest thing on earth? He said, I simply walk into my study, I sit down, I put the paper in the typewriter, and I fix the margins, and then I turn the paper up, and I bleed. A person who's creative is an artist, no matter what he's creating in. And if they're creative in that respect, they don't even care about their audience. Fellini, when he makes a film, he doesn't care whether anybody ever sees it or not. Truly? Right. Is that a quote from Fellini? That's a quote from Fellini. Is that right? Interesting. I wonder if that really doesn't play hob with the function of an artist. If indeed you can say that I create for my own sake, my own edification, my own titillation, and to hell with anybody else, is that truly a gauge of art as a form? Because isn't art a shared experience? Isn't the excellence of art dependent on a reaction from the outside to someone's work? I think that the That'll the be just director, about enough out of you, Doris. If yeah. I hear another word out of you. I think to, uh, the director who said he didn't care about, his, uh, about the audience's reaction is caring about it. I mean, it may be his intention. Bergman said at one point that the audience needed medicine, and it was his to dole out. But he still thinks of the audience as an integral part of making the work. That is, when he directs a scene, it will be seen by people someday. Therefore, he takes the audience into account. I mean, it might I think not be the present audience. Ives carted the music into the barn. Mm -hmm. mm. But in other words, we thinking, hear it now. you know, aware of the fact that this may not make it in my time, right. but ultimately sure. shall make it. Of course, I think there's a, isn't there a risk you run if you preoccupy yourself with audience reaction? at the expense of either your own integrity or your own artistic judgment. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that 90% of the writers who walk around laying claim to the honored sobriquet of writer are thinking in a sizable portion of their mind, uh, will they love it in Des Moines? Will they understand it in New Orleans? And consequently will deliberately prostitute and write downward to, to, what, to what they believe is the lowest common denominator. And when you start to preoccupy yourself, I think you're in trouble. This is not to say that I, I wouldn't share the Fellini feeling, if indeed that's the way he thinks, that I will write only for dirty old Rod, and that which pleases me must please you, and if it doesn't, to hell with you. But, on the, but the reverse, I think, the concern should also be extant, that I must realize that because I am writing in an art form, the whole function of the art form is to be translated to other people. There's a, an, an emotional experience to be shared. Consequently, it isn't just me and my tower. It's how people will react to what I write. Do you feel that many young writers are so anxious to uh, expose a cause that their characters lose believability? No question about it. Moot point, valid point, altogether well said. Head of the class if there is one at the moment. Yes, Dave, and understandably so, and I'm altogether sympathetic. What are you dealing with now in terms of plot points? themes, concerns now, the world and everything in it, hunger, poverty, the anguish of the human race, the desperate sense of self-destruction that we entertain all the time, the deep pervading gloom that comes with our inability to cope. Of course you're going to over-concern yourself with issues. It's right that you should do so, and it's expected this year, next year, but not three years from now. Leave that soapbox behind. Carry with you at all times your sense of caring and your concern, but put it into the mouths of flesh and blood people. If not, write tracks. I mentioned storylines, and you both indicated to me that it had been done, and I didn't realize it. That's a risk you run often. Even the, the best read of us, not to be defensive about it, aren't 
totally aware of all the classic literature and you'll come up with a plot line which you think is altogether unique and you're in your own. I once did a show on the Twilight Zone about a guy who makes a bet that he can keep quiet for a whole year. Now, I did not realize it at the time, but uh, there was a short story called The Bet, and I think a Chekhov sh short story, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, that's one where he was so. locked in the glass that's right. room in the yeah. men's club. That's right. Yeah. He constantly talks, and a fellow says to him, if, if you keep quiet and, and are willing to you know, uh, be under observation so we know you don't talk and not say a word for one year, I'll give you 50,000 pounds. And he says, great because he desperately needed the money. So they put him in this glass room. Do you recall this story? Mm -hmm. And uh, he doesn't say a word. And the only and the, there are two switches to this story. Number one, the year ends, and he is let out of his glass room, and in truth, he has said not a word. But the guy who made the bet with him, despite the fact that he's a member of the club, doesn't have 50,000 pounds. He doesn't have five pounds. And here is a guy who's remained silent for an entire year to win a bet, and the guy can't cover, can't honor his bet. And then the second switch is that our talkative one is so talkative that he really didn't believe that he could stay quiet. So he had his larynx cut, his sound, his sound uh, box. So you have the double irony there. Now, if, for example, I pose the problem to you that there is a talkative one amongst us, uh, and, and somebody makes a bet with him that he'll remain silent, for a year, can you fill up a story this way? What happens? <coughs> the silence is well, absolutely no, so right, right now. <laughs> you can take it a lot of different ways. Tell me uh, one. I you could take it in terms of what the man then does do, assuming that he's not put in such a glass cage. Go on. Assuming that he then must uh, fulfill his need to talk by other activities. Go on. Uh, You're coming close you to Chekhov now, Steve. Right, yeah, you, you can take it through uh, all kinds of very, very uh, strong emotions and very, very strong kinds of physical things. Uh, you could take it to his writings. You could take it to a certain kind of uh, concentration on his own inner self, a, a self-analysis. So what happens at the end of the year? <clears throat> no, follow the point. Can you tell me? I, as I said, there, there are five or six different ways that you could do All it. Right, each, let's each say, I, I'm going to give you the Chekhov line now. Uh -huh. There's a sh altogether shallow, talkative, big-mouthed klutz who makes this bet. In the Chekhov story, he goes in and for the first time in his life has a kind of an enforced yeah. serenity. There's nothing he can do because talking has always been a sort of force majeure. That's all he could do properly. He begins to read. Do you recall the story, Doris? No. And after 12 months of reading the classic literature of our time, he comes out the most well-rounded, the most beautifully thoughtful, sensitive human being who ever lived. He knows Thoreau, he knows Socrates, he knows Moses, he knows the word of God, he knows the word of the ancients and of the angels, and he becomes an altogether incredibly well-rounded man. That's the Chekhov story. There's another way you could Go. take that, assuming that uh, he accepted the bet, and then following him in those situations where we normally communicate our feeling by talking in a love situation with a child, with friends, uh, and all of the emotions, and then, and then scoring the fact that he's having a very difficult time and is very inarticulate by action, by the actions of love or fatherhood, uh, signs, the languages of sign and touch. Without voice, he senses. cannot... He cannot do these things. But was, finding at the end of the year that his difficulty gets, gets less, he brings this under control so that at the end of the year, when he's about to win the bet, that doesn't matter anymore because he's found that, that words are not a particularly That's pretty good. reasonable. I'm more cruel than that because I would have him need that money desperately to... He feels that the money would help him uh, get his marriage on stable grounds, you know, have his children love him and all this sort of thing. But by the time he's been quiet and hasn't communicated with anybody for a year, everything's fallen apart anyway and he can't... That, the money that goes back to the old, you the know, my wife needs still the yeah. or something. Yeah. Saying yeah. You know. he, he, when he went in the room, he felt he needed the money. When he came out, he no longer felt he needed exactly the money at Exactly the check off line, right. Dave. But as he walks out of the room, everybody will not talk to him. They just walk away. And then he sees the hearse go by in the road. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You went there. to check off one better.
How about your uh, philosophy? Like we talked about mailers being an existentialist and things like this. Uh, would you inject yours into a piece of work or into your character and try and have the novel or the short story or the movie or whatever it is a part of you in that Forever, respect? Forever, constantly, and sometimes to my undying discredit art. Intentionally or unintentionally? I think it's totally unintentionally. I think it's a purely subjective exercise. I don't think I'm aware of it. But very often, one of the major problems with strong writers who deal in dialogue above plot, which happens to be, I think, more my forte than, than plot, dialogue, if you look at some of the pages of the stuff I've written, and even some of the good things, shut your eyes, you won't know who's talking, because they all talk alike. And who do they talk like? Me. <laughs> now, that's wrong, and it's something I've got to lick over the years, but it's a, the most common literary problem, I think, of strong dialogists. Do you make notes and outlines and characterizations and plot outlines and things like that, or do you just take off and write? I take off and write out of a sense of desperate compulsion. I always write as if uh, I'd just gotten my x-ray from the doctor on Monday, <laughs> and he'd best check with the insurance man and see whether or not the house is free and clear. I always write with a sense of desperate urgency. Now, I don't think this is necessarily a preoccupation with my own demise, Doris. I think I'm good for another 18 months at least. But I, I always write as if, gee, get it down. Now, other writers, and many fine writers, and many writers finer than I, I might add, are very craftsmanlike, meticulous uh, delvers into, into structures, scenes, costumes, autobiography or biographies of their people. They have everything seen down in note form before they begin. They also have a very good idea of the sense of, if it's a play, their acts. If it's, a, if it's a novel, their chapters. I don't at all. I just have a rough sense. Would you write more than uh, one work at a time? I mean, do you feel you have to have that pressure behind you? I write pretty get well that way, Dick, time. because I'm sort of a, you know, a product of the Times, which is the mass media. And many television writers and screenwriters will dabble on a couple of levels at the same time. Uh, not with the knowledge of their employers, but, you know, for their own edification. And they do this, I think, out of compulsion in part, out of the fact that they may have become hung up in one of their projects, and very often just because that's the way they work best. Uh, I wouldn't advise it necessarily, you know, as a run-of-the-mill approach to writing. But if you can handle two or three projects at a time, I don't think that hurts. If you can totally divorce yourself from the other. Is there any kind of therapy such as writing about yourself that helps? <coughs> I think so. Characterization? I think self-knowledge is one of the beautiful and marvelous and creative aids that we have. Know thyself. Uh, because you can look at yourself in the mirror and get a whole list of all of the human attributes and human frailties that are extant. Whatever is wrong with you is conceivably wrong with most of your peers. Whatever is decent and good and fine and caring that is a part of your nature is also the meritorious aspects of, again, your peers. But if you know yourself, and this is one of the marvelous key self-tests that you can make all the time in your writing, just a piece of dialogue, would I say it? And if I heard it, would I believe it? That kind of thing. All writers are born and right. never made. The talent to recreate in language, the experience of life, is, has to be God-given. On the other hand, uh, we can sharpen the wit of a writer. We can point out style to him. Uh, we can uh, use the criteria that is age-old, 3,000 years of theater, uh, that he can utilize to make a judgment on the value of his own work. Uh, we can show him what can move people, what can move human beings. He can go to see a play of Dyer Van Frank, and that's lesson one in the long facet of the human emotion. Uh, this kind of thing, with this kind of heart and simplicity, will move people. And that's a lesson. That's a great educative experience for him. Uh, this is not to say he must go out and write a story about a doomed child in an attic, but uh, the level of emotion that he can learn from that film is quite an experience for him. Uh, but when you, you pose the age-old question, Art, uh, 
can I learn to write? Uh, can I be taught to be creative? Uh, can I be taught further uh, to analyze and dissect and observe? Because observation is key. This is paramount in the right of the creator, to observe life. Uh, no, but you can say, those are where your eyes are. And you can say, use those eyes in that ghetto over there. Or you can say, take that typewriter and take it up to your room and spew it out, that gut-level feeling that you have. You can show them how that's done. You can teach them a sense of, uh, of timing, uh, a sense of discipline, which is paramount to the writer. You must be the most self-disciplined beast walking the earth. Uh, nothing, in, I don't think there's anything on earth as difficult as writing. I, I wish more good writers would put themselves and their own works to a test. I wish they would write. I too often hear from students, for example, uh, or from anyone. Uh, I get this in the mail via correspondence in sizable, voluminous amounts. I'm not a writer, but I've got this idea. And if you could just write it. Well, that's not the key question. The key question is, can you sit down and write it? Would you try? And then, of course, they're hung up by style and technique. They're hung up by uh, how do I split a page for a television script or something like that, which is hardly of the essence. It's story that counts. It's heart. It's feeling. It's reality. It's legitimacy. It's authenticity. It's honesty. It's the capacity for the printed word or the spoken word to move you. These are the key things, not if you know how to split a script or if you know how a, 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 a screenplay or uh, do you know what a camera direction is, this sort of thing. You can learn that in a trade school, I'm sure, and pro probably in seven days. Very often I find that within the framework of the science fiction or fantasy genre, the use of traveling back in time is a very effective way of producing contrasts, uh, of producing a kind of a freewheeling storytelling device which is why I used going back in time. And there's another reason, <coughs> which very much relates to any discussion of creativity, is that every writer, and I don't think there are any, I can't conceive of anybody not falling into this pattern who writes, has certain special loves, certain special hang-ups, certain special preoccupations and predilections. In my case, it's a hunger to be young again a desperate hunger to go back where it all began. And I think you'll see this as a running thread and through a lot of things that I write. And part of creativity, of course, is being able to have the capacity to convey that kind of hunger, that kind of nostalgia, that kind of bittersweet feeling to those who have never had it. I think that's the most singularly difficult part of the act of creation, particularly in story form. Uh, I can tell you a thousand plots, brilliant premises, that are really knock you out. And, and as a producer of a show, I've had uh, writers come to me and say, gee, I've got a notion. And they then proceed to tell you a brilliant notion to the point of the climax. And that's where everything dissolves. Mm -hmm. Suddenly you wonder, where is Act 3? What does he do? What happens? But Doris? But how do you overcome that? You know, how do you, how do you find that climax? Should you write the climax first? If you have the climax, I would much prefer having the climax and then build my house around that climax rather than start with a premise and have to worry. I'm in the middle of a project right at the moment, which is, I think, a terribly interesting, bizarre notion of the freezing process of the human being in which a, an astronaut, Congressional Medal of Honor winner, marvelously knowledgeable uh, space aviation guy is suffering an incurable disease which really requires for his survival the replacement of certain organs and because of the transplant phenomena of the rejection thing they can't possibly perform the operation so they freeze his body they, they, they do a, a, a biopsies kind of thing in which 18 years hence when they are now surgically able to fix him and put him together and perform the transplants they will do so. Well, 18 years go by and he wakes up and they perform the operation and everything is fine, but he wakes up to a world which is so ugly and overpopulated and full of vermin and, and ecological nightmare that he doesn't know how to survive in it. 
Now, you're going to ask me, well, what happens? And I don't know. I wish to God I did. And that's where I'm hung up. And it's that desperate climax problem. You pose a problem here. The creator has this problem. Say he wants to tackle any current social evil, which most men of goodwill must admit is, in a sense, an evil. And however you slice it, whatever your political spectrum, whatever your you know, innermost beliefs, uh, any government which usurps the legitimate aspirations and legitimate aims and legitimate functions of a people is, by nature, more, more bad than good. And that's any government. The people should, I believe, be in the ascendancy. They should control. The people should have the power, which is, I think, fundamentally a democratic form of government. On the other hand, you are given a, an assignment to create a story which deals with an evil element. Let's say we have to do a musical about Adolf Hitler. Now, can you conceive of any single redeeming human feature that you could insert which would, in a sense, at least allow you a modicum of sympathy for this little man? Now, I can't. If somebody were to say to me, you have 30 years and a million bucks a year, and all you have to do is research Schickelgruber in Austria, beginning with his house painting and ending with his death in the bunker. And I swear to you, young people, I could not, for the life of me, conjure up any redeeming feature. I was traumatized into writing by war events by going through a war in a combat situation and feeling the desperate sense of the terrible need for some sort of therapy. Get it out of my gut, write it down. This is the way it began for me. But I don't have the problem that George had, that George poses as the problem of, of translation and communication, because I came back with 11 million other guys who had very similar problems. So it was not unique, nor was it not to be expected that of this class of 46, we, were, we had very special problems that we were going to write about. Now, in the case of the young student today, his point of view is different. He is a much freer soul. He is a more sophisticated man, and he's far more mature than we were, even with our war experiences. I think the, he's a much more social animal, much more terribly aware, and much more impatient. He doesn't want to go through the same ritual that we have gone through for years, and as has the young writer gone through for years, the business of... Uh, I must starve in a garret for 13 years, or I must have at least 37 rejection slips that will cover at least one half a living room wall and a part of the john. Uh, the young writer doesn't want that now. If he thinks if I have merit, if I have quality, if I have something to say, you better sure as hell publish it. And is not nearly as, as subservient to, to custom as we were. Now, it behooves the professor nowadays <coughs> to be altogether cognizant of the new breed of creator. Well, what should this professor do to encourage the young writer? Well, I think, first of all, every professor should take a cram course in what are the problems of our time as they relate to the young. Uh, we don't have, I don't think, except in strangely primitive, vicarious way, uh, any real knowledge of what bugs you people, of what turns you off, of what concerns you, of what gives you aches and grievances, of what gives you this desperate sense of impatience. I think it's altogether customary and painful that, and I share the instinct with my own children, that when they come with this problem of the aged, the problem of the hungry, the problem of the have-not, and I say to them in my old man fashion, well, now look, we've had hunger, we've had geriatric problems, we've had the problems of the, of the put-upon, of the ethnic minorities and the rest of it. They all, these things will come out all right. They say, no, no, they won't come out all right. Because the fact that you have them and I have them means that they're not going to come out all right. That's one thing. Now, that's, now we're talking substance, right. what we're writing about. Now, in terms of technique, the new form is the no form. The new form in terms of liter literature, in terms of the motion picture maker, is to wing it. Get that formless piece of clay and do it any way you want. Don't look at the way Rodin carved, mm -hmm. and don't look at the way uh, any of the, the masters carved, or painted, or wrote. Find your own milieu. If you can get across your idea, get it across. If it comes in the color of purple, you know, with mobiles hanging from the sky, with four people speaking an ancient Greek, 
If that's your bag, you, that's the way you do it. There is no other way. Who are we to say that's wrong? So that my, my response to your question, George, is the professor, number one, should know what your problems are, mm -hmm. at least vicariously. And number two, say, don't preoccupy yourself, don't fret, don't tear hair, don't pull off your shirt in tatters because you've missed a comma, because you have a run-on sentence, because you've spit an infinitive. To hell with all that. What is, of the, what, what is the, of the essence, what is key, what is major here is what have you put down as an idea, as a set of characters, as a conflict? This is what's important. So what? after you've done that, what do you do with it? I mean, what do you personally do with it? Do you run out and you shout it from the steeple tops? Or well, do you uh, that's the lock it in a drawer? I guess that's the instinctive mm -hmm. thing that we all should do when we write. Find the, uh, you know, the, the nearest ear of a friend and say, I have just written, I think, the great American novel definitive Pulitzer Prize winning play, or simply the fine quote for all time, all men and all seasons. And I suppose uh, the key problem here is find the guy sufficiently honest to respond legitimately and authentically and with a sense of objectivity. But way down deep, who do you have to satisfy? Yourself. Absolutely. Every time. I think so. The instinct of creativity must be followed by the act, the physical act, of putting it down for a sense of permanence. Once you get that prod, that emotional jar, that I have witnessed something, or I have felt something, or I have seen something, or through observation, I have been moved by an event, I think the answer is get it down, get it down quickly, write it down. Now very often, by virtue of its, the, the very uh, uh, enormity of the emotion, you will write it down in perhaps a distorted fashion, or an improper fashion, or an incorrect fashion, or your values may be a little juxtaposed. You may be too moved by the emotion. Uh, you haven't stepped far enough away back to get a perspective of the event. But I think as a basic overall thing, the clue to the writer, to the creator, is don't let it die a boiling in the head. Mm -hmm. Don't let it exist as just a simple memory that will move you or will conjure up a beautiful tune later on. The principal obligation you have as the writer is to go to a climax which interests and excites and, and if it doesn't satisfy, uh, at least makes an audience sit up and take notice of it. It must also be valid. It must take the various character traits of the individuals involved in your story and make them do something or react to something as their nature dictates. This is to say that, for example, if you're dealing with a Quaker pacifist, who is constantly being beaten around the head by the neighborhood bully and who suddenly at one given moment in, in his life says, I will not turn my cheek again, I will hit back, and does so. You must, have, you must absolutely believe that there is a moment when a man will turn his back on a fundamental belief and do something foreign to his nature. Or the reverse is true. You can show a bully who all his life has stepped on people, who does it out of a sense of sheer cruelty, who has no sense of the value of the dignity of other human beings or the feelings of other human beings, and in a given moment in time put into a position where he has a chance to save someone he couldn't care less about, but literally risks his life to do so. There must be a reason he does it and a believable explanation as to why he does it and the fact that you believe that he does it. This is the sort of thing you must do. Let us say that in our analysis of the, uh, the art of creativity, we have uncovered the following truths and uh, verities, that uh, creativity is an altogether personal thing. It's an art that cannot be taught normally. Uh, it's a demanding, frustrating, challenging facet of the human experience uh, that, by and large, one can create so long as he is ingenious, novel, different, imaginative, uh, as opposed to the more sedentary and staid professions in which the use of the imagination is not paramount. The guy that fixes the pipe can be competent and skillful, amazingly so, but putting one pipe on another doesn't require an act of creativity. I think these are the truths that we seem to have touched upon. Does anybody have anything to say sort of en passant here, in passing?
Well, just the fact that that does not become a creative act until this man finds a new way of doing it. Ah, Until good. this man fixes a pipe in a way or solves a problem in a way in which, Absolutely. In which no one has, has I, ever done I, it. Absolutely. I stand before. corrected, Steve. Build a better mousetrap. That's an act of creativity. I like your original uh, statement before where you said about the, the writer, the way the writer creates. He sits in front of his typewriter and he bleeds. Yeah, that's not my original. I can't remember who said it. I, I think, though, it, it comes down to the point that, you know, we all have to give a little bit of ourselves. No question. I think and a writer writes, you know, and he, we've been talking about it for a while now and have examined some of the problems, but finally he doesn't talk about or worry about, I don't think, uh, if he's going to be a writer. The mechanics, he writes. To find yourself good. your own separate. I don't piece. think he's going to be able to write with bare feet after stamping in the you know in the grape vat necessarily. I don't think that he can enjoy total license to just you know throw mud balls on the wall and say that is art. I think there has to be certain legitimate criteria which govern a form. But let's say that he must not preoccupy himself with commas and adjectives mm -hmm. and the rest of this stuff so long as a whole idea can be created. And this this passing remark of my own. Uh, in terms of creativity. I think the most singularly oft asked question is one that Doris asked me. What do you do? How do you do it? How do you create it? I find it very difficult. I think Doris has mentioned this a couple of times. In truth, you will always find it difficult. The creation of an idea, the following of a story germ, the building up of a plot, the creating of people, of flesh and blood character, these are not easy things. They're extremely difficult. But conversely, don't be put off by the fact that this month you can't do it, and next month is maybe even harder. This is, if not a lifetime process, it's awfully close to it. The writer broadens, becomes deeper, becomes more observant, becomes more tempered, becomes much wiser over a period of time passing. It is not something that is injected into him by a needle. It is not something that comes on a wave of flashing, explosive light one night and say, huzzah, eureka, I've got it, and then proceeds to write the great American novel in 11 days. It doesn't work that way. It's a long, tedious, tough, frustrating process. But never, ever be put aside by the fact that it's hard. If it weren't hard, everybody would be a writer, and we'd have nothing but books, slovenly, grubby, filthy, heavy, <laughs> gudgy books weighting our world down. The fact that it is a very selective and a very challenging process, unique to a few, is what makes literature so valuable and so wonderful. Well, you've been fine. Thank you all of you very much.